Hi, I'm Malika Bilal. And I'm Omar Badar, and you're in the stream. Today we're mixing it up a little, bringing you not one, but three conversations looking at the latest from stories we've been following. First, we'll tackle Australia's offshore detention policy, then garment factory standards in Bangladesh, and finally catch up with fencing champ Ibtihaj Mohamed. So let's get started. Hi, my name is Kevin Iraniha, and I'm a graduate of international law, and I'm in the stream. Australia's High Court has upheld the country's policy of detaining asylum seekers in offshore processing centers. The judgment clears the way for approximately 267 asylum seekers, including children born in Australia, to be deported to the remote island of Nauru. It sparked strong reactions on both sides. Thousands have protested with cries of let them stay and close the camps. Human rights groups say detainees have been subjected to violence and abuse, but the government argues the policy of deterrence is necessary to stop deaths at sea, and many Australians say they're pleased with the decision. Well, from Melbourne to discuss, we're now joined by Khan Karapana Giotidis, founder of the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre. And Muhammad Ali Bakiri, he's a youth ambassador for children out of immigration detention and was a former asylum seeker himself. Welcome both of you to the stream. I want to start Thank on you. my laptop with a look at this Facebook post from Daniel Andrews, who is the leader of the state of Victoria. And he's just one of several leaders who have called in recent days for the, the uh, government to allow asylum seekers to stay. So Khan, you see this, you see there's clearly a divide politically. Is it representative of the divide among average society in Australia? There's definitely a political divide. It's a vote winner in our country to be brutal towards refugees and to demonize refugees. Um, but really the divide is one between whether we're going to make moral judgments that are based on compassion, decency and international law, or whether we're going to make easy political judgments, which is what our Prime Minister is doing at the moment. He's doing what is politically easy, not what a leader should be doing. Mm. So we have people online who are raising an interesting question about all this. We have Neslihan over here who tweeted in saying, the first settlers from the UK and Europe arrived in Australia searching for a new beginning. Why is this different for these asylum seekers now? And we have Armun over here who says, considering Australia's deeply entrenched racism towards the continent's own native people, sadly what is happening right now is not surprising at all. Mohammed, how much of thing do you think that has to do with racism? Had the refugees actually been from European countries, do you think their treatment would actually be different? Well, there is, there's, there's always this, um, people who come to Australia, they go through this, um, I guess, hardships where, when they're living in Australia. And personally, when I got out of the detention center, I went through the same thing because we have language barriers separating us, culture differences, traditions. And a lot of people who come from a third world country, uh, that would be really hard for them. But for people that are coming from Europe, it would be easier because the, they've got the language and it's there. Uh, which makes it easy for them to communicate and live life in mm -hmm. Australia. Mm -hmm. And Khan, I saw you nodding your head there when Mohammed mm -hmm. was talking. I know that you've spoken to people who have reported back to you about some of the conditions. What do they tell you and, and how does that make influence really how you go forward with this issue? Look, I would firstly say there's no doubt Islamophobia is helping drive this. You, we would not be freaking out in this way if they were a boatload of white people. The fact they're brown and black and sometimes Muslim is very critical to the fact there is an issue of race happening here. Look, what I'm hearing firsthand is, and what's so extraordinary, is that a government of a democratic nation is sitting and trying to tell the Australian people that this, the best we can do is send children and women and men to open air abuse camps where their own independent reports show that women have been raped. We've personally worked at the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre with two women who were gang raped, one who was set on fire after being gang raped, uh, had to come to Australia for an abortion. We know of children being sexually abused. We know of the independent MOSS report saying that women had to um, offer to show their own naked body or those of their child just to mm. get two extra minutes for a shower from the male guards. We know these are facts. We know that in the Nauru inquiry done by our own Senate, your Congress equivalent in the US, that the detention operators themselves said we cannot guarantee the safety of the children and women and men here and yet here we have our government wanting to deliberately and knowingly send people to be raped and abused because they're trying to tell us that's the best australia can do that's a disgrace so right on that point we got a tweet here 
uh, from the Refugee Action Committee talking about these conditions, saying many detained refugees uh, in these detention camps are gravely suicidal and say that they would rather have drowned. And then we have uh, Pretty Hat Machine over here who says, to ensure quality of the detention centers, Australian politicians should spend a week in each of them anonymously as detainees. Mohammed, just to look at it from the other side, for people who actually want to send refugees away, just to take their argument, uh, you know, to play devil's advocate in a sense, do you think there is a way to turn people away without putting them through these kinds of conditions? Do you think Australian politicians, if they really got a feel for what this is like, they would actually choose a different route for turning people away? I mean, if, if, <clears throat> if you want to help people, there's always a way of helping people. If you don't, then that's a different question. Um, people are fleeing uh, war, and persecution um, from their from the countries and coming and knocking on Australian door to please let them in is a sign. Getting on a boat on that rough sea is not easy. And personally, when we came with my family, there was 150 people on our boat, and our boat was caught on fire. Where um, people were um, jumping and panicking and running around, and I guess the Navy ship of Australia was there and it took them two hours to rescue us. They could have done that a bit earlier, but their intention was not to let us in and make, and make a U-turn for us to go back. But there were people who didn't want to go back because previously they made the same journey to travel to Australia, but they were returned forcibly by the Australian government. And so then you spent so, three years there, correct? On Nauru? It's, it is correct. Um, First, we were taken to Christmas Island, then followed to Nauru. Um, the reason why they took us there was because they wanted to process our um, claims. And we were happy at the fact that they will take us to Nauru, and so soon they will reprocess our claims, and we will end up in Australia. But when we actually went there, I swear to God, as we were landing, the island is so small that I didn't even know that how did the plane even land it there. Um, you can literally go around the island in, in, in 15 to 20 minutes. That's how small it is. As, as we all know that Nauru is known for its phosphate. All the phosphates have been taken out by Australia. All you see is sticking sharp rocks there uh, around the detention centers. And the heat is crazy there. And people living in army tents. I've been there. I can tell you the bad situation inside and, and the circumstances of people living in those detention centers. Mm -hmm. People, I mean, the tweets that we just got, people trying to commit suicide, people doing self-harm. I mean, I saw that. I witnessed right. that as a kid in, those, in, in that detention center in right. Nauru. So, so knowing all of that, knowing Mohammed's stories, knowing other people's stories, Khan, that you've heard, what's your plan moving forward in the next few months? And how do you, what do you plan to do about this? Well, we plan to keep fighting and campaigning until they shut down Nauru and Manus Island, Manus Island where the Australian government's killed more refugees and it's safely settled. Uh, we can intend to keep lobbying until the 267 women, children and men whose lives are at stake right now are given sanctuary in this country. These are moments in time we're at a crossroads as a country where we either continue down the path of hatred, intolerance, racism and the politics of xenophobia and fear, or we draw a line and say we have a moral and humanitarian obligation to take our fair share. Mm -hmm. We're a rich, prosperous country. We're a nation of both people on Aboriginal land, ironically as well, and we can do better than this. Refugees deserve better than this. We're better than this. And that's what I intend to do with the very last breath of the rest of my life is campaign for a just and welcoming Australia that sees the extraordinary potential resilience of refugees, upholds the rule of law and international law and protects them. It's not too hard to ask. We're so obsessed with stopping mm. the boats, which is just die somewhere else than we are about why are these people on the boats in the first place, which is they are fleeing for their lives and they simply seek sanctuary, right. which me or you would want okay. if it was us on that boat. Thank you, Khan. And that's thank the you. same, the same, uh, thank this you, Mohammed. also the same. Mohammed, we'd All love right. to get your thoughts and we can get them in the form of tweets. Feel free to tweet them to us at hashtag AJStream because I know that there's much more on this story, of course, that could be said and more for those 267 people whose fate is in the balance. We'll continue following this story very closely. Thank you to all of our guests. Moving from Australia to Bangladesh. After the Rana Plaza factory collapse killed more than 1,000 people in 2013, high street retailers pledged to improve health and safety conditions for garment workers. But recent incidents have served as reminders. There's still work left to be done. That's right, Malika, and we're actually hearing about it from our online community as well. We got a video comment here from Aisha. Check it out. 
The reason brands are in Bangladesh to begin with is because it's cheap which means workers work long hours for little wages. Then there's the added complication of the multi-story buildings that have been set up to accommodate this billion dollar industry. Yes, there have been more safety inspections through the Alliance and the Accord and more brand collaboration since Rana Plaza. But have brands individually done enough? Absolutely not. In order for brands to do that, they'd have to take more direct accountability for the well-being and safety of the people who make their product. And that's what we'll discuss with Judy Gearhart, the Executive Director of the International Labor Rights Forum. Also with us in Dhaka, Rubana Haq is Managing Director of the Mohammadi Group. That's a garment manufacturing company that employs 9,000 workers. And we'll start this discussion online where there's a lot of conversation. That's right. We kind of have an interesting divide on where the pressure ought to be focused. So we have Al Higgins over here who says companies use positive rhetoric for PR reasons. On the ground, little has changed. The real answer stands with employment reform. Judy, I want to throw this to you. Do you think it, you know, the pressure ought to be focused on the companies themselves or changing the labor laws, essentially, to make sure that people are treated better? Well, so you, you clearly need to do both, the labor law enforcement as well as the company uh, reforms. But you know what we've seen is we've seen a tremendous improvement in the inspections and the rigor of inspections in terms of structural safety, electrical safety, fire safety. What we haven't seen is the change we want in purchasing practices of the global brands and um, the extent to which why some of these factories aren't being improved. There was just a fire at Matrix Sweaters early Tuesday morning. It's a factory that's supplying brands that are in both of the major industry reform initiatives, the Accord and the Alliance. Um, you know, we're, we're struggling to get these factories actually improved. Even though the inspections are better, the changes aren't happening. But there's another big piece here, which is are the voices of workers being heard? And this really goes to the enforcement of labor law. Um, workers' ability to organize trade unions, bargain collectively. Um, you know, in the, since Rana Plaza, there's been more organizing, but workers haven't been able to negotiate agreements. There's been still a lot of beating of workers who are trying to organize unions. And this goes to the core of the problem. The workers aren't able to have a voice in the workplace, which our report that was just released in December talks about in detail. You can find it at laborrights.org. Right. So, so we really so need Judy, to solve let's that piece. Let's pose that over to Rabana, who imply, employs 9,000 workers. What do you have to yeah. say to what Judy uh, mentioned? Well, I absolutely agree with Judy. I mean, there is no controversy there. It's just that uh, everything takes time. Two years is too little a time period to change the realities overnight. I mean, it's it's not a cosmetic treatment. So be it labor law or its implementation or complete remediation of the entire industry, it will take some time, but the process has begun. So that makes us hopeful, but that does not give us the right to be defensive as a, as a community. So we need to collectively have a single narrative. I mean, the buyers cannot just say that we cannot raise prices and you still need to be better. We, the manufacturers, cannot just say that, you know, we cannot do this because we don't have the money or the infrastructural support. The consumers cannot just say we want cheaper goods and yet want the best practices. So our narratives basically need to be one. We need to be saying the same thing, and that is we must stress on the workers' safety and its workplace safety. And, and, and there's no controversy there. It's just that the... The, the conversation has been on whether the progress has been slow mm. or whether we are not remediating at all. I'm sure Judy will also agree that the process has started, but of course, we will need more time. Mm. So on the question of what consumers can do, we have this tweet here from Megan who says, we have to be responsible buyers, boycott multinationals who refuse to demand high standards from their contractors. But Judy, you know, we hear this debate a lot about whether boycotts actually could possibly end up hurting the workers that people want to help. Do you have any sense of whether boycotts are an effective way to go about things? Yeah, so we work a lot with uh, grassroots worker organizations in Bangladesh, and they don't call for a boycott. Um, they don't see that as the solution. I, I do think the solution has to change the dynamic in Bangladesh vis-a-vis -vis workers' ability to speak up at work. And from the report we just did, that hasn't changed. We found workers who said, yes, they've inspected my factory, but I still cannot 
talk to the manager if I'm afraid about the conditions in my workplace. So if that dynamic between workers and managers doesn't change, and that goes hand in hand with the ability of workers to organize and bargain collectively, then all the inspections in the world aren't going to change things fundamentally. I want to show you a headline here among many that have been circulating. This one says, Bangladeshi factories remain unsafe. So in the next few months going forward, especially since, you know, two years on since the Rana Plaza collapse, 2013, you say things have changed, but not enough. What do you think is the most important thing that needs to be focused on, Judy? So I agree with Rubana that things have started and there needs to be more time. Um, I know we work a lot with the Accord for Fire and Building Safety in Bangladesh and they would like more time. The question is, is whether or not all of the added time for the inspection and the factory repairs to be done can go hand in hand with changing the ability of workers to speak out and the rights of workers to speak out. Mm. Rubana? Yeah, I, I just want to add something to that. And that's, you know, the, the remediations that we are talking about actually involves a lot of other things. I mean, it's not only just remediating in the existing factories. Some of the factories cannot even be used. So, you know, a couple of us have to just relocate to other locations, and that takes time. I mean, building a new factory, getting the required infrastructural support requires a lot of time, and that transition needs to be allowed. Otherwise, we will never be able to get it straight. And, and seriously, I mean, we still have a long way to go. I mean, we'll at least take another year or year and a half to get our things right. So it's not only structural safety, not only fire or electrical safety. Right. It goes way beyond this. What, what, what's most important is, and I, I agree with Judy, and that is it's not just the dialogue between the workers and the managers. It's the dialogue between the owners and the workers also. Right. There has to be a direct bridge. And Rubana so, Huck, that so is exactly a... the point that we will check back in on. You said about a year, a year and a half, so we'll, we'll give it that. Uh, uh, thank you for being with us today. Thank you also to Judy Gearhart. Please keep us posted on what's happening with this issue in Bangladesh. And from Bangladesh to fencing, meet Ibtihaj Mohammed. Now, she has fans all over the world and even got a shout out from President Barack Obama during his visit to a Baltimore mosque last week. When Team USA marches into the next Olympics, one of the Americans waving the red, white, and blue will be a fencing champion wearing her hijab. Ibtihaj Mohammed, stand up. I told her to bring home the gold. <laughs> Not to put any pressure on you. No pressure. Ibtihaj Mohammed joins us now from New York. Did you feel pressure in that moment, Ibtihaj? What, what did that feel like? Just a really exciting uh, moment, you know, for me to not only qualify for the Olympic team, but also have, you know, uh, President Obama give me a shout out in the middle of his speech is pretty exciting. So I first heard about uh, your accomplishment in this article. This is one that I'm pulling up on my laptop here. Vincer Ibtihaj Muhammad qualifies for Olympics, will become first U.S. athlete to compete in a hijab. And that was all over Twitter in just a matter of moments. When did you first hear and what went through your head? Mm -hmm. um, so I was in Greece this past weekend for an Olympic qualifier. And I was blessed, you know, to finish on the podium. I uh, captured the bronze medal. And in those, in those moments uh, during the qualification process, you know, um, I'm focused on the next competition. So I'm thinking about, you know, um, my training and, you know, uh, being in the, the best, like, physical position and um, mental position in order to, you know, keep up this journey of qualifying for the Olympic team. So I hadn't even thought that maybe that had put me, you know, that, that particular you know medal had put me on the Olympic team so when I woke up on Tuesday morning to you know this swarm of like phone calls and text messages and you know tweets and things like that I was just as shocked as everyone else so if they has naturally we have people a lot on, in our online community who are asking about the hijab part of things we have Sophia over here who tweeted in saying how do you deal with the detraction from fencing that the hijab brings headlines about your qualification doted on it I'm curious I mean do you think do you think yourself primarily as a fencer who happens to be Muslim or do you actually want the attention to you as a Muslim fencer as a Muslim American you know is that is that part of 
your persona that you would like to focus attention to as part of community representation? Um, you know, I live every day as a minority in this country. Uh, to say that, you know, my, um, my hijab or, you know, my skin color aren't relevant, I think, um, would be kind of uh, missing a little bit of the point. I, I think my journey as a minority athlete has been not always been an easy one for me from the time I was a kid. And if anything, I want people to learn from my story. Um, I, I would hope that you know the struggles that maybe I've I've experienced in all my years uh, as a fencer. Um, I would hope that you know this kind of uh, brings a light, I guess, to the struggles of of, of minorities in this country. And I hope that it, it, you know, opens the door for more discussion um, about being more accepting of, of people of different backgrounds. Mm. And when we talk about opening the doors, one of the, the bigger ones that opened is the one that we started this segment of the show with uh, when Barack Obama, of course, called you out. I want to show this tweet that you tweeted. I'm in the DMV for uh, the president's first visit to an American mosque. And I know you had a, uh, a round table with him. What did you discuss? You sat down with the President of the United States, and I, I don't know if you envisioned yourself doing that when you were young and just starting out as a fencer or not, but what were those talks like? What was going through your head? You know, um, I, I, it wasn't, you know, just me. There were a few other, um, you know, notable uh, American Muslims who were also seated at the table with the President, and a lot of people just discussed some of the concerns that they had as Americans and contributing members of our society. Uh, one of the uh, trending themes amongst everyone was, you know, uh, Islamophobia and how that affects them in their day-to-day -day lives. I, you know, spoke a little bit about my journey and my experiences and how those things affect me as an athlete. And beyond just the, you know, facing Islamophobia in life in general, we have people who are curious about what it's like basically in, in fencing. So we have Nafiu over here who mm -hmm. says, have you ever encountered any form of discrimination from your teammates on the account of your hijab? Um, you know, uh, I wish that I could say no. Um, it's a reality of mine that it hasn't always been an easy journey, but I think that that's one of um, the things that has made this journey of mine so rewarding is that even in the face of adversity, I've been blessed to be so successful in my sport and also be in a position where I, I can tell my story. And the most important thing for me is that, you know, other minority youth can see themselves in a position of being successful in the world of elite sport. Mm. So you are now, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, second in the USA team's, uh, fencing team's uh, standings on points. What comes next on your road to Rio? That's the hashtag, of course, people are using. You're using it yourself. There's a tweet here, chase your dreams until your dreams become your reality. Road to Rio, and there you are in full athlete mode, uh, looking like you're ready to compete. Uh, what comes next training-wise? How do you get ready for something like the Olympics? Um, so the Olympics is kind of, you know, the pinnacle of, of sport, and it's, one of the, those like pinch me moments for me, I still cannot believe that I, uh, you know, my childhood dreams have actually come true and I've been blessed to qualify for the Olympic team. And, you know, the goal is to just stay healthy and to make sure I'm in the best position I can be in order to not just, you know, be at the games, but also to hopefully bring home a medal. Of course, we hope you do as well. What does what, what your family think in your community? How are they reacting? Um, everybody's, you know, just as happy as I am, and they've all been so supportive of me over the years. So it's uh, rewarding for me that I've been able to do this for for the Muslim community as a whole. I, I want to uh, end, of course, because you have many hats. I want to end on one that I pulled up on my screen here, Luella. This is your fashion designer as well. Uh, do you have plans to introduce a sport version of this, especially uh, knowing that you're heading to the Olympics? Yeah, that's definitely something that's on my list of things to do. As soon as I you know, finish competing in Rio, God willing, I would love to expand um, that it's been tough, you know, trying to wear these two hats simultaneously as athlete and entrepreneur. But once, you know, I'm finish competing, that will be my primary focus, and I'm really looking forward to it. If the hash, so are we. It's a long list. We are out of time. Thank you very much. Good luck in Rio. I know people online are wishing you luck as well. Remember, keep us posted on the stories you're following. Till next time, Oprah and I will see you online.